Someone said, everyone is entitled to their own opinions, but not to their own facts. You know, our opinions will never change the facts. Stay tuned for more on polygamy. What love is this? She was born into polygamy. Her family followed the teachings of Joseph Smith, all of them, including plural marriage, especially plural marriage. Like many young girls, she had been promised to a man who was her father's age. But she fled. She ran away. She preferred an eternity of outer darkness to a life of polygamy. She chose hell over religious enslavement. That girl was me. After I fled, I thought I was free, but I realized I wasn't free. I was lost, alone, desolate. No home, no hope, no life. Then Jesus Christ found me and rescued me and he loved me. In his love, I found real freedom a real home, a real life. And Jesus offers you the very same thing. He is a shield to all who will take refuge in him. He has been a refuge for me, and he can be for you too. Knowing the surpassing love of Jesus Christ today, this is why I can look back and ask, polygamy, what love is this? Welcome to our show tonight. I am Doris Hansen, your host of Polygamy, What Love Is This? And we thank you for sharing part of your evening with us tonight. I thought I would just mention very quickly um, about the uh, new government, the, the interim head of the gov new government in Libya. They suggest, he suggested earlier this week that the country now stick closer to Sharia law and begin allowing polygamy again in that Muslim nation. Well, that remark uh, sparked some concern around different nations and also for the women in Libya. One of the Libyan women said, all the girls are mad that he said that. She said, I don't want to marry someone who's already married. Another Libyan woman said that he had done a disservice to females. This is totally wrong, she said. Men can never treat women equally. Women gained rights in the 1970s in Libya, she said. We don't want to lose them. It seems as though the women in this third world country know that polygamy is in the interest of men only and certainly is a practice of inequality. I'd also like to mention that the FLDS um, uh, polygamist Meryl Jessup's trial started this week. It was Monday that it started. Uh, they thought maybe the prosecution would end his uh, 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 prosecuting today, but I'm not sure what happened. I didn't check on it. Uh, before we came down to the show, but Meryl uh, Jessup is the one who performed the marriage of his 12-year-old daughter to Warren Jeffs, and so it'll be interesting to see how this trial turns out. And I'd like to also mention that next week on our show, we will be discussing the issues surrounding DNA and the Book of Mormon with Jim Catlin as our guest. And of course, this discussion concerns all, everybody who believes in and trusts the Book of Mormon, so stay tuned for that. You know, there have been reasons and rationalizations given through the decades for the practice of polygamy. And the most popular one is that God commanded it through Joseph Smith, and whatever God commands is good. The Mormon belief is that polygamy is holy, it was practiced by biblical characters, and since no scorching lightning bolt from heaven put a stop to it, it must have been okay with God. But they couldn't be further from the truth. Mormons have taught that uh, the unbiblical doctrine that there was a spiritual pre-existence and that Adam in the pre-existence had many wives and Eve was just one of them. Brigham Young said in Journal of Discourses, Volume 1, he said, when our father Adam came into the Garden of Eden, he came into it with a celestial body. Well, that's wrong. God said he made him out of mud. 
and he said that he brought Eve, one of his wives, with him. So you can see from the very beginning that they taught polygamy. They also taught that Jesus was a polygamist, and prophets of the Mormon church have officially explained that doctrine. Um, Brigham Young said in Journal of Discourses, Volume 13, and I quote, The scripture says that he, the Lord, came walking in the temple with his train. I do not know who they were unless <clears throat> they were his wives and children. Orson Hyde said, Jesus was the bridegroom at the marriage of Cana of Galilee. Now, there was actually a marriage, and if Jesus was not the bridegroom on that occasion, please tell who was. If any man can show this and prove that it was not the Savior of the world, then I will acknowledge I'm in error. We, that is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, say it was Jesus Christ who was married to be brought into the relation whereby he could see his seed before he was crucified. Before the Savior died, he looked upon his own natural children. Now that was by Orson Hyde, and you can read it in the Journal of Discourses, Volume 2. Wilford Woodruff, president of the church, wrote in his journal... And I quote, Sunday I attended the Sabbath school conference and Joseph F. Smith spoke upon the marriage in Cana at Galilee. He taught Jesus was the bridegroom and Mary and Martha the brides. Another justification for polygamy is that polygamous marriage makes possible the procreation of hundreds of thousands and millions of spirit children so they can get human bodies. This, of course, is another myth, and it has no biblical uh, or historical basis. Another myth is that uh, many Mormon men died from war and from disease, leaving behind, widow behind widows and excess females who needed husbands to support them. And there's no basis of fact for that. In fact, a census um, consistently showed that there were always more men than women in the territory. So that is, is a straight-out myth. But polygamy is and was an essential for eternal life in early Mormon doctrine. They either lived it or they were threatened with damnation. They taught that when a good Mormon man dies and he faithfully followed the doctrines of their gospel, which includes polygamy, in fact, polygamy was on the top of the list, that he would earn status as a god, he would receive his own planet or planets to populate and be the ruler, his wives would go with him and enjoy and participate in eternal sexual relations to make spirit babies in order to populate his planet or planets. This is known as eternal lives or eternal e increase. And eternal increase is prominent in the foundational Mormon church doctrinal teachings. You'll find that phrase all over early Mormon teachings and sermons and so on. And that's polygamy in the hereafter, in the eternity. Early Mormonism taught that celestial marriage, which is and was polygamy, is indispensable for the eternal life of Mormon women. The only way that she can get to celestial heaven with him is to marry a man with the priesthood, and priesthood men lived polygamy. The doctrine, of course, conveniently forgets that Jesus is the Savior, neither a woman's husband or a church or ritual or marriage or anything else has any merit whatsoever for a woman's eternal life. Even though the modern Mormon church is disgusted with polygamy and has distanced itself from it, most generational members of the LDS church have ancestors, and some are not so distant ancestors who were polygamous. And strangely enough, they are extremely proud of their polygamist heritage while at the same time hating polygamy. Go figure. Also, modern Mormon fundamentalists have the attitude that if polygamy was good enough for their own parents and grandparents, it must be the right thing to do, and so they'll do it too. The greatest tragedy of all this is that they do not research what God really has to say regarding polygamy. They merely take someone else's word for it. They get a fuzzy feeling or, or they get some kind of a guilt trip that it's the right thing to do. And then they'll plunge into it with all fours, never stopping to realize or seeming to care 
that it's their own eternity that they're placing in someone else's control and they're gambling it away. We often hear this culture saying polygamy was good in the time of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young. The families were close. They were happy and content. They learned to live and love together. But is this true? Were the early Mormon polygamist wives happy? We decided to focus some of our show tonight on a few of some of the quotes and comments of some early Mormon polygamist wives so you can make your own conclusion. Were these pioneer women really happy in polygamy? Are polygamist wives happy today? Well, the answer, of course, depends on what they call happiness. There's one thing I do know for sure. They are not happy in Jesus. Jesus never taught polygamy. In fact, the opposite is true. He was clear in his teaching that there are no marriage relationships in heaven. And he, Jesus, is the word of God. And God's word said a man is to have one wife and a woman is to have her own husband. In our research, we have easily discovered that many women were very upset practicing LDS polygamy. Most of them unhappily resigned themselves to the misery of the practice. Some actually went insane. Some died of a broken heart. Some were neglected to the point of death. And some were hunted down and killed when they tried to escape polygamy. There is not a moral practice ever commanded by God that results in this kind of pain and agony and heartache and loneliness and violence and bad fruit as polygamy. The pain that is experienced in polygamy is unequally shared by the females. Yes, there is difficulty in some areas for the husband, but it's small and insignificant compared to what the women have to suffer through. God is not the author of polygamy. God has better things planned for the women of his creation. God does not show favoritism. And we'll be happy to meet with any of our viewers if you want to contend with us on that statement. We'll look at the evidence together and we'll determine right from the heart of God to discover if it's consistent with His character to have planned polygamy or made it part of His sanctification process or part of His eternal life plan. So let's look at some of the quotes from those pioneer Mormon women who experienced Joseph Smith's polygamy. And we are going to begin with the U.S. presidential nominee candidate, Mitt Romney's ancestor, his great-grandmother, Hannah Hood Hill, was the daughter of polygamists, and she also was a polygamist wife. And she wrote in her autobiography about how she used to walk the floor and shed tears of sorrow over her own husband's multiple marriages. Interesting that Mitt Romney made a speech in 2008 that he will follow the faith of his fathers. And the faith of his fathers is polygamy, pure and simple. Sarah Pratt she said, and I quote, Here was my husband, gray-headed, taking to his bed young girls in mockery of marriage. Of course, there could be no joy for him, except the indulgence of his fanaticism, and of course, something else, perhaps, which I hesitate to mention, end quote. That was Sarah Pratt speaking of her husband, Orson Pratt, who dated a 16-year-old girl and then married her when he was 57. Isn't it rather hypocritical for the modern LDS to damn Warren Jeffs when their own revered apostles did the same thing? Marianne Angel, she was a plural wife of Brigham Young, or the king of polygamy himself, and that's, of course, Brigham Young. And she said, and I quote, God will be very cruel if he does not give us poor women adequate compensation for the trials that we have endured in polygamy. Sounds like Marianne was a miserable polygamous wife. 
Zena Huntington, the widow of Joseph Smith and plural wife of Brigham Young, said this, and I quote, It is the duty of the first wife to regard her husband, not with a selfish devotion. She must regard her husband with indifference and with no other feeling than that of reverence. For love we regard as a false sentiment, a feeling which should have no existence in polygamy. How sad that these polygamist women could not even dream of having a love affair with their own husband. Brigham Young in Journal of Discourses, Volume 9, said, and I quote, Sisters, do you wish to make yourselves happy? Then what is your duty? It is for you to bear children. Are you tormenting yourselves by thinking that your husbands do not love you? I would not care whether they loved a particle or not, but I would cry out like one of old, in the joy of my heart, I have got a man from the Lord, hallelujah, I am a mother. And you know, it's quotes like this from Brigham Young and folks like him that we have to ask on this show, polygamy, what love is this? There is no true love found in this kind of a marriage. How horribly revolting that a man like Brigham Young, who had dozens of wives and showed partiality. He was rude and crude. He was unfeeling. And he tells his wives, your joy is not to be in your husband, but in the children that he gives you. We can't help but wonder how much enjoyment that Brigham Young experienced in his bedroom encounters with the women of his harem, we even read the story that Brigham Young met a nice little 10-year-old boy one day on the street and asked his mother, who was with him, who this proper-mannered young boy was. And she politely but coldly answered him, He is your son, sir, and turned and walked away. And Eliza Young, who was a plural wife of Brigham Young, said, and I quote, one woman said to me, while giving me some of her experiences in polygamy, the greatest trial I ever endured in my life was living with my husband and deceiving him by receiving Joseph's attentions whenever he chose to come to me. Some of these women have since said they did not know who was the father of their children. This is not to be wondered at. For after Joseph's declaration annulling all Gentile marriages, the greatest promiscuity was practiced, and indeed all sense of morality seemed to have been lost by a portion, at least, of the church. That's in Wife Number 19 by Ann Eliza Young. And we ask... 12 million members of the LDS Church and 50 to 100,000 polygamists place their eternity in the hands of this promiscuous, self-proclaimed prophet of God, Joseph Smith. That's spiritual suicide. It's spiritual illiteracy. Do you know what willing blindness is? It's when you have all the facts available and you have all the facts are knowable, but you choose not to investigate, you close your mind, your eyes, your ears, you walk away from the opportunity to discover the truth. 12 million Mormons and tens of thousands of polygamists are willingly blind. Mormon polygamists declared that polygamy was the highest principle possible given by God. Annie Clark Tanner said, and I quote, As a girl, I had been proud that my father and mother had obeyed the highest principle in the church. I was aware now that my mother's early married life must have been humiliating and joyless on many occasions because of her position as a second wife. She also said, A woman in polygamy is compelled by her lone position to make a confidant of her children. It's pitiful we think, that her husband was not fulfilling that position. He is the one who should be her lover and confidant. Sarah Pratt, again, the wife of Orson Pratt, said, Polygamy completely demoralizes good men and makes bad men correspondingly worse. As for the women, well, God help them. First wives, it renders desperate or else broken heart, heartbroken, mean-spirited creatures. And I'm here to tell you, I have seen a lot of that. There was and there is much cruelty in polygamy. 
Anne Eliza Young, again, in a letter to Mormon women, said, It is the very refinement of cruelty, this polygamy, and its hurts are deeper and more poisonous than any other wounds can be. They never heal, but grow constantly more painful until it makes life unendurable. The late Kimball, who was the wife of Heber C. Kimball, said, quote, she, the plural wife, must lay aside wholly all interest or thought in what her husband was doing while he was away from her and be pleased to see him when he came in as she was pleased to see any friend. We wonder how the late put up with her polygamist husband. He had somewhere between 43 and 45 wives. And we must consider his infamous comment, I think no more of taking another wife than I do of buying a cow, and if you want to build up the kingdom, you must take more wives. Now that is a sweet remark, isn't it? Helen Mar Kimball, 14-year-old wife of Joseph Smith and the daughter of Heber C. Kimball and the late Kimball said, and I quote, I had, when seeing the trials of my mother, felt to rebel. I hated polygamy in my heart. She also wrote, I would never have been sealed to Joseph had I known it was anything more than ceremony. I was young. They deceived me by saying the salvation of our whole family depended on it. Obviously, sexual activity was the more than ceremony part of her marriage to pedophile Joseph Smith. She was only 14. He was in his late 30s. Don't we have something like that going on today in the court system that everybody is just condemning? Why does he get to do it? And don't use the excuse that we can't judge his morals then on, on the morality of today. God's morals never change, ever. Emmeline B. Wells, she wrote, and I quote, Oh, if my husband could only love me even a little and not seem to be perfectly indifferent to any sensation of that kind. Oh, my poor aching heart, when shall it rest its burden only on the Lord? Again, we have to ask, what kind of love is this polygamy? Obviously, not the kind of love that God ordained for a man to have for his wife in their mutual commitment to a lifelong monogamous marriage. That was modeled in with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and that's God's heart on polygamy. Brigham Young gave Mormon women a two-week deadline, an ultimatum, leave or stop complaining about polygamy. Now, this is a long quote, but in order to get the, the, the whole impact of what he was saying, we're going to quote it all. And so I begin with this, and I quote, It is frequently happening that women say they are unhappy. Men will say, My wife, though a most excellent woman, has not seen a happy day since I took my second wife. No, not a happy day for a year, says one, and another has not seen a happy day for five years. It is said that women are tied down and abused, that they are misused and have not the liberty they ought to have, that many of them are wading through a perfect flood of tears. I am going to give you from this time to the sixth day of October next that you may determine whether you wish to stay with your husbands or not, and then I am going to set every woman at liberty. And my wives have got to do one of two things, either round up their shoulders and live their religion, or they may leave. I will go into heaven alone rather than have scratching and fighting around me. I will set all at liberty. But if you stay, you shall comply with the law of God and that without any murmuring and whining. Sisters, I am not joking. I know that there is no cessation to the everlasting whining of many of the women in this territory. If the women will turn from the commandments of God and continue to despise the order of heaven, I will pray that the curse of the Almighty may be close to their heels and that it may be following them all the day long. Prepare yourselves for two weeks from tomorrow, and I will tell you now that if you will tarry with your husbands after I have set you free, you must bow down to it and submit yourselves to the celestial law. You may go where you please after the two weeks from tomorrow, but remember that I will not hear any more of this whining. 
This was by Brigham Young. You can find it in the Journal of Discourses, Volume 4, pages 55 through 57. It was also printed in the Deseret News. Now, Brigham Young would not have been forced to proclaim this ultimatum if the polygamist women were free and happy with polygamy with their husbands and with their sister wives. Notice the remarks of the complaining, the whining, the murmuring, the scratching and fighting. Sounds like polygamy was heaven on earth, doesn't it? Why would Brigham Young, think about this, have the power and the authority to set the women at liberty? Only slaves need liberty. A free person doesn't need permission to be set free. That remark clearly shows that early Mormonism was autocratic, it was theocratic, it was despotic, and it was cruel, and that the female population was indeed enslaved to polygamy, to Mormonism, and to their men. Also, this setting free offer to the women was a very safe ultimatum, and Brigham Young knew it. Because if a wife decided she wanted out, they wouldn't let her take her kids. She'd have to leave alone. Where would she go? Who would she go to? Brigham Young knew his ultimatum was safe and would never be acted upon by the women who were enslaved by polygamy. On top of that, Brigham Young promised that he would pray a curse on every woman who made the choice to leave. Now that's Christian, isn't it? Didn't Jesus say that we are supposed to pray for our enemies, that we are supposed to bless them and not curse them? Just another proof that the foundation of Mormonism is not Christian, and they never wanted to be referred to as Christian, and their practices were decidedly not Christian biblical practices. Well, let's look at some quotes from contemporary polygamist women. We'll start with Mary Mackert. She, from a quote from the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, she said, you stuff your feelings so long that you just don't feel your feelings anymore. Now, Mary Mackert was the sixth wife in a polygamous marriage, and she wrote a book called The Sixth of Seven Wives. She experienced it. Susan Ray Schmidt was also in Lifting the Veil of Polygamy and the sixth wife of Verlin LeBaron. And this is what she said, quote, After reading section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, I came to the only conclusion possible, that God loved his sons much more than his daughters. How could this be possible? We were created in his image, weren't we? Did he love and value my son more than my daughter? Oh, this just didn't make sense. She cried out to God with a broken heart, God, oh, Heavenly Father, can this be true? If it is, then you obviously love your sons much more than your daughters. Aren't we just as lovely and valuable a creation? Why should a man deserve so many women to love and care for him, to desire and adore him so that he's never lonely, and yet his wives are, for, are heartbroken, abandoned, and forlorn? We raise our children by ourselves, and they hardly know their father. I don't understand. Why? The men get to be gods, and we're just their handmaidens. Is that fair? Is it? Can this be right? God, why did you bother to give a woman, to give women a heart and a mind and a brain? Please help me. I'm confused. Susan Ray Schmidt wrote a book called His Favorite Wife. This is on page 352 of that book. Carolyn Jessup, polygamist wife to Merrill Jessup of the FLDS, whose trial, by the way, started earlier this week, as I mentioned. After her marriage to Merrill, she was introduced to some men at a restaurant as his new wife. And she says in her book, quote, They were happy and excited for Merrill. I felt like a complete object. One of the men made some lame joke that compared, to, uh, uh, that compared a new wife to a dog. Merrill laughed and said dogs were better because they were more loyal. He made another joke comparing marriage to a bath. Once you get into it, it's not so hot. The man laughed. I never felt so degraded. You'll find this on page 81 of Carolyn's book, Escape. Makes one wonder why Merrill Jessup took so many wives, if that's what he thought of it. Irene Spencer, 
The second wife of Verlin LeBaron also wrote a book, and she said this, and I quote, I've personally known hundreds of plural wives. Their smiles are a facade required by them, of them by their husbands and spiritual leaders. It's up to the women to make plural marriage appear to be the superior mode of marriage. It's demanded that the wives present themselves as united with one another, with their husbands and with their religious communities. The success of plural marriage depends entirely on their willingness to play the sacrificial role and play it well, end quote. And that's in her book entitled Shattered Dreams, page 382. And then Jenny Jessup Larson of the FLDS wrote this in her book, God really does have it in for women. God tells men who to marry, and yet we're all supposed to be his children. No one ever talked about God asking if the girls minded who he had chosen for them. Besides, why did he have to tell it to a man? Didn't he think girls had ears? I know of quite a few girls that were told who to marry. They didn't like the idea at all. Even tears didn't keep them from being given to some old geezer they didn't want. If it's God's will and you get your reward in heaven, you must keep in mind that the more you suffer here, the bigger the reward in heaven. Hogwash. If that's the kind of God we have sitting up there in heaven, either looking down on us with a frown or a smile, depending on if we are obedient to what those men say, then I'll take hell. Can't those brainwashed women see through the scheme? And that's in her book, Jenny Jessup Larson, entitled From Brainwash to Hogwash, page 85 through 86. And so this is just a short compilation of modern polygamist women's quotes about polygamy and also early Mormon pioneer women's quotes about living polygamy. It isn't that hot, ladies and gentlemen, and those who want to make it legal, and those who think that it is just a viable alternative lifestyle. And uh, we did a book review a couple of weeks ago on Love Times 3, and they had nothing but good to say about it, but we have a wide example here from modern and early women who don't have that much good to say about it at all. So we're going to open up our phone lines now. Our number is 801-973-8820. We'd love to hear from you. Give us a call. Remember, we desire a two-way dialogue, and if you don't allow it, we'll cut you off. And it's halftime, so we have a halftime message for you. <laughs> You are watching Polygamy, What Love Is This? Broadcasting live from Salt Lake City, Utah. This program is the broadcast outreach of A Shield and Refuge Ministry. Shield and Refuge is a point of first contact for Mormon fundamentalists who question the doctrines of the religion or who are actively seeking for an opportunity to escape the polygamist lifestyle. Examining the claims of fundamentalist doctrine against the backdrop of biblical truth is central to our efforts. We invite you to contact us. Call toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. You are welcome to join us in our monthly support group, Life After Polygamy, where you can meet others like yourself who are searching for answers about polygamy and Mormon fundamentalism. We meet monthly in the Salt Lake City area. For more details about time and place, call us toll-free at 877-425-9993 or email us at tv at aboutpolygamy.com. We want you to know that we've made available to you some outstanding resources free of charge. You will find them at our website, www.whatloveisthis.tv. There you will find the DVD, Lifting the Veil of Polygamy, which documents the real-life stories told firsthand of those who were lifted out of the culture of polygamy through the power and love of Jesus Christ. Also, free of charge to you is the booklet, Is Polygamy Biblical? It explores plural marriage in the context of God's Word and answers questions like, Did God ever command polygamy? Is it part of God's plan? While you are at our website, Make sure to take advantage of the archived episodes of this program, which can stream on demand directly to your computer. There are more than 100 shows to choose from. And if someone you know is unable to view this program via live broadcast, 
recommend that they visit this same website every Thursday at 8 p.m. Mountain Time to watch this show through live streaming video. Simply follow the links to the live streaming video page. If you are watching live tonight, we invite you to call us as we open our phone lines. The number is 801-973-TV20. That's 801-973-8820. Now, back to Polygamy, What Love Is This? with our host, Doris Hansen. Welcome back to the show. We thank you for hanging out with us during the halftime message. And uh, we've been talking about what early Mormon pioneer women thought about polygamy and what modern, some modern-day polygamists also thought about polygamy. Uh, we do have more to share with you, but we do have a phone call coming in and a couple more, so we will take them and then move onward. Catherine is calling from Murray. Hello, Catherine. Hello. Yes, Catherine, you're on the air. Hi, I have a question. Uh -huh. I'm curious, um, what happened to the 12-year-old bride that he married and is she living in Utah? Are they still married? Now, are you referring to... I don't need to stay online or on the phone. I'm watching your program now. Uh, if, well, if you want to listen, then you need to hang up for the answer. But let me clarify the question. Are you talking about the, the one that I talked about earlier today where the guy has gone to trial? Yes, so the 12-year-old the that he married. Okay. Are they still married? Well, well Warren Jeffs is in prison now. Um, the, the one that uh, Meryl Jessup went to trial for uh, because he performed the marriage and it was his daughter, when, when the officials went into the ranch in um, um, April of 2008 and took all the children out of the ranch, uh, that 12-year-old girl was one of the children they took and she is the only one that wasn't returned back to the ranch. And so there obviously hasn't been any contact, at least not any sexual contact. Okay. Great, thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay, thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay. Um, it'll be interesting to see how this trial does turn out. I do have an email here I would like to read uh, from someone who, uh, by the way, is an ex-Mormon. She wasn't in polygamy, but she's talking about how she was taught about polygamy when she was a member of the LDS Church. She said, I saved all my notes from my institute class back when I was 18 and 19 years old studying the Doctrine and Covenants and about polygamy in Doctrine and Covenants 132 and how polygamy is a higher law and that we will be required to live it in the celestial kingdom. She said, as a Mormon, that thought repulsed me, but I consoled myself with the thought that makes most LDS members feel better when we're in the celestial kingdom. We won't feel the same way we do here. It'll be different. We will have a greater understanding, no jealousy, nothing like that. We were also taught that sexual intimacy was an eternal thing as well. How could there be no jealousy if our husbands would be having sex with many wives? How is that normal? And seriously, no wonder it's harder for men to open their eyes to the truth of the LDS church. Sometimes they give up a lot of perks to leave. Priesthood authority, power and control, being a god of their own world, having multiple wives, etc. As a girl of 12, when I learned about polygamy, I knew it was wrong. I put it up on that shelf like we're all taught to do, and they all still do, and that's how they mentally accept it. And a comment on this from another ex-LDS woman said, It just continues to amaze me that this barbaric practice of polygamy is held up as a higher order that all celestial kingdom Mormons must embrace, at least mentally in some form of acceptance. I wonder how they can stay sane living with such contradictions. Now, the Mormons have been taught they will live polygamy in the celestial kingdom. It's part of their doctrine. The myth that Mormons will live polygamy in their celestial glory has been perpetrated since Joseph Smith pulled that ugly polygamy rabbit out of his hat. The old rationalization that polygamy will be pure and holy and beautiful in heaven with no jealousies raises the question, are we less in heaven than we are here? 
Don't the polygamists and the Mormons believe that man becomes like God? Not only like God, but a God? Let me quote from the King James Bible something that may blow your Mormon polygamy mindset. Exodus chapter 20 verse 5 says, For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God. 34.14, For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Deuteronomy 4.24, For the Lord thy God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. Zechariah 1.14, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. If you think the Lord God Almighty is a jealous God like He says He is here, do you think that you're not capable to be a jealous spouse if the Mormon polygamy heaven were true? Not on your, well, not on your eternal life. I'd like to refer to Zechariah 1.4 where God is jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. By the way, Zion is in Jerusalem. It's, Jerusalem. it's not here. <laughs> or Missouri, by the way. It's in Jerusalem. If God himself can be jealous of a city, why wouldn't his polygamous wives have the capability of being jealous of his attention to other wives? Emotions and feelings will be enhanced in heaven rather than crushed. If God is capable of jealousy, why wouldn't a plural wife be capable of it? Again, those who believe in and cling to this doctrine are placing their eternity on a myth. It isn't biblical. It isn't logical. It isn't factual. There are no marriage relationships in heaven, no eternal Mormon polygamous families, no polygamist or anyone else gets to become a god. Okay, we have a call from Brennan in West Jordan. Hello, Brennan. Brennan? Yoo-hoo, Brennan. Brennan. Not there? Maybe you can try back. One more chance, Brennan. If you would like to make a call. Well, I guess he doesn't need another chance. Okay, there looks like there's another call coming in, but they're not ready yet, so I have another email to read. And this one um, is a little bit difficult to read because she has long, drawn-out sentences and sometimes no punctuation, and, and her, her language wasn't the best either, but we'll try. It's from Miss N., she said, Mormons are not polygamous. The Church of Jesus Christ doesn't practice polygamy anymore. Look in the Book of Mormon, and there is a commandment in the back labeled as a declaration telling the Mormons not to practice polygamy. It happened almost 200 years ago. If Mormons are polygamous, then plead, please add in that Everyone else in this world with religion are murderers because the Catholic Church committed quite a few murders in the beginning and every single Christ-related church on this planet can be traced back to the Catholic Church except the LDS Church and the people who have chosen to branch off of the LDS Church. All they do is take what someone likes about the religion and change what they don't like, and that's all branching off is. So you're either a murderer or a polygamist, which, to be honest, I would rather be the latter because murder is pretty blank big sin. Stop saying Mormons. Do your homework and call the real commu polygamous communities F dot LDS or whatever they're called. But it's not fair to group Mormons in with something that happened so long ago, just like it would be unfair to call you a murderer. Stop using the name Mormon. It makes you look stupid. You sit up there and talk of Christ and God like you're someone that has a throne next to them when you die. For your information, no matter who you are or what you believe concerning Christ and God, we all know that they are perfect beings. I know that whatever we believe, Christ and God love us. Maybe they don't love our actions, but I know He loves us all. I also know that if they came to earth, they would not walk around saying, What the blank were you thinking? Polygamy? Murder? Drugs? They would love us. They wouldn't go on TV and tell everyone how wrong they are. They would teach. You know that. 
What you're doing is something Satan would do. Satan would tell you how stupid and ugly you are. Just think about what that while you're in bed tonight and how Christ-like are you really participating in this show. Your show is incredibly offensive, not only to me, but to everyone, because you are not supplying the truth. Fix it and find something better to do than bash on others' religions. Wow, this woman gave me a solid thrashing, didn't she? You know, it never ceases to amaze us or, or, or keep us from gasping when people write in and bash us as they charge us with bashing them and their religion. It happens all the time. She said our show is incredibly offensive to everyone. But does she know everyone who watches the show? She must if she's truthfully saying that. And she got on me because I wasn't being truthful. And we say to her, and we want to say to all the everyones that are being offended by the show, exercise your free agency. Don't you have an off button on your TV? And if we offend you, you can just turn us off. And, and don't try and deprive other people of their free agency, those who are watching the show and learning from it. And there are plenty of people who are learning from this show. And when I use the word Mormon, I'm only doing what your church does. So when you change the name of your book and you take the word Mormon out of it and the word Mormon out of the name of your choir, perhaps the world will also feel okay not calling you Mormons. And every Christ-related church in the world except the Mormons did not come from the Catholic Church. I would suggest you do your own studies, ma'am, uh, rather than depend on someone else for your intelligence. And finally, you said that the Catholic Church committed quite a few murders in the beginning. Perhaps you need to read about Oren Porter Rockwell. And how about Wild Bill Hickman, the headhunters of the early Mormon church? Wild Bill Hickman alone killed over 50 people under the direct order of Brigham Young. And Porter Rockwell was known as the angel of, de of, of vengeance or also the destroying angel. We wonder why you don't study your own history. And I mentioned earlier in tonight's show that it wasn't unusual for an escaping polygamous wife to be hunted down and murdered in the early Mormon polygamous years. Again, if you're so offended with our show and with me, turn us off. Then research whatever offends you. You might be surprised at what you discover, unless, of course, you want to leave your eternal life in the hounds of a scoundrel who already has and is leading millions down the wide road to eternal destruction because of their blind faith and blinded faith. Okay, we have a call from Sherry in Riverton. Hello, Sherry. Hi. Hi. This is Doris. Yes, this is Doris. You're on the air. Um, the question that I have um, is from the, you know, the Old Testament. Um, many of the prophets in the Old Testament had, I guess, I would call it polygamy, had a, a wife, more than one wife, had um, concubines. And my question is, why did God allow it then? Uh, Sherry, let me ask you a question and, and to help me explain it to you. Okay. Um, the Bible tells us, and I think we all honestly would acknowledge that, we, that we're all sinners. We've all committed some kind of a sin. Right. Uh, in, in the lie, whether we lie or cheat or steal cookies or whatever it is we do, we're all sinners. Right. And, and God had given the model for marriage with Adam and Eve. He also told in Deuteronomy 17, 17, the king was not supposed to multiply wives to himself. And there are many places in the Bible that indicate that God does not want polygamy. Right. He also didn't want murder. He didn't want rape. He didn't want Sabbath breaking. He didn't want the children to dishonor their parents and so on. I know, yeah. But he didn't, he, di he, 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 he didn't just kill the people immediately whenever they broke one of his laws. And no, that, but what I'm trying to understand is where the, the way it's written in there is that God pretty much said 
go ahead and do it. No, he didn't. You won't find that anywhere. I know the Mormons say that. So do the polygamists. They they say that that God told uh, Sarah to give Hagar to Abraham. Right. And God told Jacob to marry four wives. But if you get in the Bible and actually read it yourself, you will see that every one of those polygamist uh, relationships mm -hmm. were sad. They were full of jealousy. They were full of contention. Uh, the wives were at each other's throats with the children. And that itself, being a negative experience for every one of the marriages, shows that it isn't something from God. Now, yeah, I, I, I totally agree with you. You know, I, I have read the New Test or the Old Testament not as much as I have read the New Testament, mm -hmm. but that, that question always came to my mind. Why did that? Why was that allowed to happen? Because God, God, I am a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Sherry, um, Sherry, he, God does allow us to sin. I, I know He does allow us to sin, and so I, I, I have always, always been against polygamy, and I thought, heaven forbid, if it ever came now that they. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, would, I wouldn't have any part of it. But the the thing that I'm, I guess, that I'm trying to emphasize in being a member, you know, on, on uh, having questions in later on in my my older life. I'm not old, old. I'm in my fifties. But you know, you gain more wisdom as you grow. Um, I just barely, probably about six months ago, found out, literally found out that Joseph Smith had more than one wife. Mm -hmm. I always thought it was Brigham Young yeah. and the other one. Right. And um, it just blew me away and really upset me. And so I, definitely I am against polygamy. I think it's a terrible thing. It shouldn't go on in any religion, in any facet but, but of life. But J Sherry, Joseph Smith said, now he this it doesn't mean it's true, but he said God gave it as an everlasting principle. And that if you didn't live polygamy, you would be damned. That's in the Doctrine and Covenants 132. Well, I, I don't believe that that's, I'm going to be damned if that happens. That's what Joseph Smith said. I, so, Sherry, either he's a prophet or he, is, he isn't. And this is, you know, this is where, what I've kind of come to that I'm really searching on, is that maybe he was a prophet, maybe he was given the Book of Mormon, and maybe that Book of Mormon isn't a Second Testament of Christ, but maybe he went mad. <laughs> Maybe he was mad to start it all. You know, you know, I mean, watch next week as we talk about the Book of Mormon and DNA. I, I mean, it'll it'll interest you as well. Yeah, but I do. I, you know, I, I just wanted to say this, Doris. You know, I, I, I as being a member, I've seen many, many good people who are loving and Christ-like people who do believe in Christ. You know, we're all here on faith, trying to find out our way in life. Well, but and Sherry, that the, that that really isn't the point. Uh, there's a lot of good people in the world. Right. Uh, Jesus came. The Bible tells us Jesus came mm -hmm. to save the ungodly. Right. And we are all ungodly. We so, are. so no matter how good we are, we're still ungodly people and need to be saved. And polygamy doesn't save us. The no, Mormon I Church totally doesn't agree with you. save I totally us. I agree with you on that. But yeah, that that was my my curiosity. My husband, I had asked him about that, you know, in the Old Testament, and he says, "Well, God allowed it. He told him it would drive him mad if they did it." Well, that <laughs> so, isn't true. That um, that's not true anyway. at all. But he did allow it, and he's allowed a lot of uh, sins. He allows us. He gives us our free agency. Right. So yeah, mm -hmm. we all are sinners, and and you know, um, mm -hmm. I just hope we all can. Uh, well, you, 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 need to, you need to find the real Jesus, the biblical Jesus. The Mormon Jesus is Lucifer's brother. The real Jesus is God Almighty who created Lucifer. I would suggest that you do a lot of studies. If you want to email me, tv at aboutpolygamy.com, I'd love to help you through some of those issues. But I've got another call to take now. Okay, well, thank you. Uh -huh. Thanks, Sherry. Bye-bye. Uh -huh, Bye. Mm -hmm, Okay, quickly, we have Brian. Hello. You have a question for Hello. He's not ready. I mostly had a comment. Okay, we have an off-the-air question. Um, how many people in Utah are living polygamy? Well, you know, I don't, I don't know if there is an accurate figure given for how many people in Utah are living polygamy. They're, they're thinking somewhere in the Intermountain West uh, from somewhere between 30 and 100,000 people that live polygamy. Um, 
but they, they can't get an accurate, an accurate count of how many people there are. I know that the polygamy groups, and this is something to consider, the polygamy groups mushroom. They're mushrooming. Uh, they're, they're, they have many wives. They have large families. They have huge amounts of children in some of these homes. Um, and so they, the mushrooming effect is taking place, and they're getting political and they are getting powerful, and even uh, some of the politicians won't even address the issues of polygamy because they don't know how many of their constituents live polygamy. So they're kind of being held at bay, uh, saying anything against polygamy. So we're really in, a, a, in quite um, a mess right now as regards polygamy, and if, if the citizens don't stand up and say something, it's funny how the state of Utah can fund uh, some things do involving polygamy, when polygamy is against the law and it's against the constitution of our state. It's forbidden in the constitution, and yet uh, we still fund many different polygamous activities. We have a call coming in from Scott Manifold. Scott, I'm sorry, but the, the show is, is nearing the end. If you would leave a message, I'll be happy to call you back, or you can call back next week with uh, whatever it is that you want to talk about. And I want to close our show tonight talking about Section 132. Section 132, I know these days is people saying it's not about polygamy, it's about celestial marriage, but it is about polygamy. It was in the early days, and it still is. Polygamy was always the alternative phrase for, for celestial marriage. Your Mormon leaders have deceived you if you think something different. You do believe in polygamy by doctrine. It's just another reason to throw it all out and to cling to Jesus Christ and to Him alone because he alone with nothing and no one else will bring you into eternal life if you'll trust him. And Jesus doesn't change. He doesn't change purpose. He doesn't change doctrine. He doesn't change requirements. He doesn't redefine terminology. Jesus doesn't change priesthood authority. He doesn't change his word. Jesus doesn't change prophetic authority where one prophet overrules and overrides a previous one and then contradicts them too. And his salvation plan and his word remain solid, sure, and unchanging throughout all generations, and his church was never in apostasy. Jesus doesn't lie. Jesus cannot lie, but Joseph Smith lied about Jesus. Anytime a condition is placed upon eternal life and you fall for it, you are being led astray. The only condition is that you receive it as a child and as a gift in repentance. 2 Timothy 4.3 says, The time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they'll gather around them a great number of teachers teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear, and this is, re is fulfilled in this culture. Sound doctrine is tromped on, terminology redefined, the truth has changed into a lie, and biblical integrity is mocked and disregarded. God says their end is deserved, which is destruction. Again, we plead with our viewers, check out what you believe and why you believe it. Good night.